What's happening, what's happening, what's happening? Of course, you know it's your boy, B-Hop Radio, shout it. Stepping in the building, I got an A-time legend, icon, one of the best to ever do it off in this thing, Sleepy Brown. What's good with it, boss? Man, chilling, living. I ain't mad at you. Yo. I ain't mad at you. I mean, the big sleepover, sleepy. This thing is going crazy right now as we speak. Y'all done came with some singles off of it already, man. I mean, talk to me about you and Big getting together, putting it down once again for the town, boss. Uh, it was something that's you know eventually going to happen, and yeah. um, we just basically, um, once I got back on the road with him, mm -hmm. um, and we started listening to tracks, we just kind of thought about it one day, and was just like, yo, let's just go ahead and do an album because the beats he were playing were pretty hot, and um, <clears throat> so we just started collecting the beats and everything, and uh, it just finally kind of fell together, you know what I'm saying? But it took, um. About two or three years to really get it together, so you know we apologize for the um, for the wait on the album, but it's definitely coming, and uh, we're really excited about it. I mean, that can't sleep, man. It had that feel. When I listen to some of those singles off of that album, I'm feeling like a so fresh and so clean 2.0 going on with this. Exactly thing, what man. it is, because I mean, normally when we work, man, that's you know that's kind of always been our vibe. We always had those special songs together, like so fresh and. The way you move and West Savannah, yeah, all the way to uh, thickets, um, yeah, thickets, and you know, just I mean, any song that me and B have done over the years, it's kind of been like that. So I knew this album was gonna turn out kind of like that way. Exactly. Yeah. What was it like when COVID hit out of nowhere and kind of put a pause on the calls in this thing? Sleep. Oh, it was cool, man, because we it gave us a chance to, um, you know, when that happened, I was basically working on. Uh, Big Sleepover and the new Goody Mob album. Mm. So for me, it was actually perfect because um, I got a chance to sit in the house and do nothing but beats all day. Yeah. So it worked out perfectly for me. I, I have no problem for the, <laughs> the COVID breakdown, making us stay at home. I mean, it's a terrible disease, but yes, you know, sir. But as far as like you know, making everybody sit down and it, it kind of it really helped me focus. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So it was cool. Songs like We The Ones, man, which y'all still putting social commentary in the music as well. I mean, what is that like for y'all making sure that y'all use the music as a vessel to let to speak to the to speak to today and let folks know what the hell's going on? Well, we always been about that. And uh actually we the ones were ex was it was actually on the organized noise E P. That's right. And uh Big thought about it and was like, Man, let's just go ahead and put it over here. So I mean it made sense to put it on Big Sleepover because we just didn't want the album to just talk about, you know, um, fucking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and talk about cars and, you know, living the life. We actually wanted to, you know, wake everybody up at the same time because we wanted the name to have a double meaning, you know? Yeah, you know, yeah. Big sleepover for the fun of it, having a big sleepover and big sleepover for you to wake up. That's exactly, so we now. wanted to be both sides. That's hard. That's hard right yeah. there. Now, I mean, lowercase with Killer Mike. Mm -hmm. That was one of those trunk rattlers, though, man. I yeah. mean, talk to me about putting that banger together. Uh, that was basically Swift, uh, our DJ, um, DJ Swift and Big Boy, um, kind of had that on the rest. When I heard it, it was uh, almost done. I was like, damn, what is this? Like, <laughs> sheesh. So, yeah. you know, shouts out to DJ Swift, man, mm -hmm. and uh, Big Boy for putting that one together. The thing came out real nice. Excuse my phone going Take out. Take your time. Damn, man. I don't know the right now. <laughs> Scam likely. You know, they love to hit your ass People up. come with it all the time. All the time. Don't say shit when you ask for fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll go ahead. But anyway. Intentions with CeeLo, though. That was another banger. Yeah, that, that happened. Um, we had a big Dungeon Family meeting at uh, Stank On You. Yeah. Because at the time, we were um, going to do a new Dungeon Family album. Just mm -hmm. didn't work out. But what did happen in that meeting that uh, uh, Ray, my partner Organized Noise, pulled me to the side and said, yo, man, I gotta play this beat for you. So we went in the B room and he played the beat. And as soon as he played the beat, I started humming in that melody to it and I'm like, mm. man, go play it for everybody. And then, as soon as he played it, CeeLo had his part in two seconds, he went and sung his part. <laughs> and we, it just kind of happens that way when the vibe is right and the beat is right and it's making everybody nod. We got some, so that right. that record, I knew that record was going. Then that record really was very special, man, because it went to number eleven on the R and B charts. That's man. right. It really would have jumped up higher, but. You know, I don't know what happened. You know how politics go. I feel that. I yeah. feel that. Now, Sleepy, while I got you in here, I got to ask you about some of my favorite Sleepy Brown joints, okay? Because uh, I'm a Sleepy Brown fan, and my number it. one Sleepy Brown song is 
me and my baby in a Cadillac, man. Mm, thank you. Can thank you talk you. to me about that banger right there? Because that's one of those repeaters. Yeah, that that record was actually it's a sample from uh, the Jackson Five, one of my favorite records as a kid. Uh, maybe tomorrow, and I always like that song. Always stuck in my head since I was like ten, or yeah. maybe like even six. And uh, so I always wanted to work with that sample one day, and uh, actually was at Ray House. And um, the funny thing is, the night before I had got arrested, mm. and uh, well, not the night before, I said a couple of days before I had got arrested, man, and uh, I was locked down for a couple of days. So that song was kind of like my getaway record when I <laughs> when I got out. You know, I felt so great and had uh, Jr. Cricket wings, <laughs> but I had about a thirty piece. <laughs> And I was sitting there playing a the record, and all of a sudden I just started hearing that mail. I said, hell yeah, I'm finna go <laughs> do this one. <laughs> so me and my baby, my Cadillac, was kinda like my ride out song from um, from jail, man. I ain't bad at that at all. You know, when you go down to, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, Rice. Ooh, when you go to Rice, boy. <laughs> Rice Street. Rice Street, boy, you sing anything, come on, damn, mom. Them niggas let you sleep on the floor. It's terrible over there, man, how they treat folk. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's crazy? Most of the male sheriffs that I, when I got arrested that night, dude, mm -hmm. most of them fools I knew from high school. Oh my God. And wasn't even like, I mean, I know I did my wrong thing, but God, you know what? Let's go on, man. I get pissed off with these fools. <laughs> these niggas. Okay. <laughs> now, I feel you. Society is a soul. Pushing. Pushing. Talk to me about that banger. And then coming back with the video at the same time, too, man. Yeah. Pushing uh, was the first single from Society Soul back in '95, and uh, it was just a it was a funk jam, man. Because really, that that whole vibe was coming off of Southern Player mm -hmm. and Cash was going in another direction. So we had records that just didn't match AT Aliens at all. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So me and Rube kind of looked at. I started singing more too, and Rube started doing more. We were like, man, let's just do a group. You know, let's let's make this the offspring of Southern Player Listing. That's hard. That's, so that basically, Society Soul album, some of that stuff would have probably been a second Outkast album if they were still on that vibe. What? Yeah. Talk to me about creating that vibe early on with Organized Noise, man, and working on that Southern Playlistic Cadillac music album. Another one of my favorites off of that album is that Crumbling Herb, man. Mm, that's I one mean, of my favorites, too. When you got times like this where you see young Dolph passing or you see just yeah. black people passing in general in the yes, streets, sir. you kind of find yourself resorting to playing that music to kind of help you get through these get times, through. man. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like creating that music and understanding that it would pass the test of time, too? Just loving it, man. Um, when we worked on that, on that album, we had so many ideas and that we had accumulated over time. And, you know, when it was time to do it, it just all fell in place. Because like, you know, with Crumbling Herb, the whole idea came to us sitting in a dungeon. And uh, Big Rube used to like, was like the, I don't, I don't know how to say, I guess the educated one out of the crew, well, not even educated, <laughs> but just knew every damn thing about yeah. everything. So he was sitting down, it was almost like a ritual. He was sitting down, and we would all be sitting on the steps and he might be talking about something he crumbling her while he doing it. Rico was like, I'm just crumbling her. He just kept saying, I'm just crumbling her. <laughs> he just kept saying like that, just crumbling her. Yeah. So it went from that to, okay, that needs to be a song. And then Ray had this beat that was just so beautiful to me. And uh, that's how it just came to be and it came out like that because, you know, that was that was one of those records that, um, that we felt like was really telling you something. Just, you know, appreciate appreciate life and how we appreciate how we move along we crumble herb man we yes, know sir. times are messed up and we know times are crazy and you know but sometimes you know we needed that advice just to make us you know a uh, numb us yeah from going to war come on you know what i'm saying yeah that's their that's it I used to call it the numb record because, you know what I'm saying, if you mad as hell, by the time you got finished listening to it, you'll calm the hell down. <laughs> Come on. You'll calm down, bro. But then even the lyrics in it, though, I mean, you saying some real stuff on that yeah. hook. It's like if that hook don't seep into your soul and let you know what you need to be focusing on, then you got a damn problem. Then you probably crazy as hell. Yeah. The <laughs> Shit. The whole thing about that's 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 why the hook was so, to me, we wanted to make sure it was just point blank. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? 
There's only so much time, bro. Just I'm just crumbling the herb. Niggas killing niggas just don't understand. It's the master plan. It's what they want us to do. You know what I mean? So it it cause it felt like black folk, we all know this is true, but for some reason we still fall back into the bull, man. So that was the kind of record to say, look, I understand. I'm black too, and I fall back myself. Yeah. But at the same time, man, we gotta do we have to think about it and, and talk to talk to each other about this so we can see how we can move on to make it better. You know what I mean? So yeah. that was just one of those records that that, I, that we wish that, you know, what we know everybody loves and everybody listens to it and they get their message from it. But, you know, I, I wanted it to start a conversation. I wanted mm. that record to really start a lot of conversation. When it comes to making thought-provoking music at the same time, though, too, because, see, what people don't understand is, at that time, the Dungeon Family was the young generation of music and hip-hop as it was. So y'all were the leaders of a new school, but y'all were leading a new school in a positive direction. Yeah, we were just taking the place of uh, Public Enemy. Um, you know, I would even say, not take the place, but just, you know, continuing yeah. the message. You know what I mean? Or like X-Clan, you know what I'm saying? Because the one thing about it, we didn't want to bang you overhead with education. We wanted to say it cool enough to you to understand it. So we had to, I don't want to say dumb it down, but make it cool. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You know, just be like, yo, not, I mean, just just make it a little more easy for you to understand and get and let it seep in without yeah. you even knowing what you're hearing. Then you'll get it one day when you can sing it to yourself. Come on now. Like that. When it comes to the music, though, Sleepy, when you got into the game, did you achieve all that you set out to achieve? Did you overachieve or underachieve? Because from the outside looking in, y'all are going out, and I mean yourself, I ain't even got to say y'all, but going out as icons and legends to do this. Well, we definitely appreciate everybody feeling that, you know, we're the leaders or the, or the icons of Atlanta. And I really appreciate it because all we want to do is give Atlanta a voice. You know, mm -hmm. it was like when we were first working on the album, we made sure to call out spots in Atlanta because that's what made us so interested in California. You had Compton, mm. Sada, Inglewood, and all this different stuff. I hear you. So we wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to say, okay, East Point, College Park, Decatur. You know, we wanted to shout out everywhere so everybody in Atlanta could get the, the, the chance and the swag to be like, yeah, I'm from the A. You yeah. know what I mean? So, I mean, that that was the main thing about it. Now, do I feel like I've overdone myself? No, I, st I still feel like I have more stuff to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that I wanted to do. Now, I'm happy of what we've been through and what we've done, and I've had the chance to put out records and meet fans and all that good stuff. That's That was a dream, too, but it's a lot of stuff that, you know, as organized knows, we wish we could have did more of, you know what I mean? But, you know, if we still get the chance, we will do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Spody Ode at Dopalicious, man. Another one of those songs where Sleepy just decided to raise hell on the track. Yeah, Talk to the, me about that banger. That's uh, 3000, man. 3000 hit me up um, one day and was like, yo, got this record. And the funny thing is he had used the uh, the band, my band Sleepy Thing, mm. uh, to do the record. So, you know, when I went in there, of course, I'm, I'm used to the sound because they're my boys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dre just looked at me, he said, yo, man, just write about, you know what I'm saying, what you go through in the day and just the cool shit that happens. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go into the club or you washing your car, whatever the fuck it is, just do it. <laughs> so that's what kind of what, what kind of came out of it, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that, I, that's one of my favorites, too. I love to perform that one. When you think about studio sessions, being part of the production and the talent side at the same time, when were those sessions that you felt like, it's going to fuck down in this studio and the world has got to feel what the hell we laying down in this thing. Wow, that's that's been a couple of times in studio cast, man, working on albums or working on um I had to say, I don't know, man, like every other project I've done, to you <laughs> true, it always always if it didn't feel like that, then I'd be like, I don't know. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, mm. I would doubt the record, but you know, we've always kind of felt like, okay, this is it's gonna be something that's gonna be insane. Like I feel like that about so fresh. Mm -hmm. I feel like that about, the, especially the way you move. Like, yeah. I feel like that, you know, because the whole thing with that song was, you know, Big Boy had a, a cookout at his house back in the day, and he just had his CD changing. We had like 200 CDs that would just switch up and change, just play whatever. Yeah. And it was a, uh, a CD he had from a producer that we all raised. Um, um, 
call Mo. Mm -hmm. That did, you know, a lot of um, the fast records back in the day. Yeah. Um, so this record, this beat came on, and it wasn't all the way done, but it had a little bit of the melody to it. And I'm sitting there, and I just started hearing, I like the way you move. I just, kind of, I just kept hearing that. So I'm like, nah, damn. So I ran down the beat and said, boy, we need to go to the studio. I got a hook for this one right here. That's going to be insane. And as soon as we did it, we knew this is going to be special. Let's go ahead and finish it up. Big Boy went there and added his flavor to it as far as production, too. And, man, it just, it, you know, that's the record that I knew. You know, Outkast, that album was, uh, Speak About Love Below, was like two solo albums. Yeah. You know what I mean? They ain't really want no more records together. Yeah. A little bit, but not really. So... I wanted to make sure that Big Side was just as strong as Dre. <laughs> yeah. Cause we knew what Dre was going. Dre was just so different <laughs> in the way his thinking. He never let us hear anything from that album the whole time he recorded. And I knew, I said, well, he got something. <laughs> Damn, this nigga won't even let us hear it. I didn't hear it, bro, until we were out in California shooting the damn video. Yeah. And we had shot The Way You Move the first day. And the second day, Dre shot, hey, y'all. And I heard that. <laughs> I was like, God, this nigga on some Beatles shit. What, the, what, is, what, what is going on? But I felt so confident because I knew the way you moved was just as strong and was yeah. right there with it. So what I loved about that time was when those records were out, every week it was, it was a battle between the way you move and, hey, y'all, they were doing like this on the charts. That's crazy. One and two, one and two, one and two. One and two. Yeah. And that just made me so happy because I just really wanted to make sure that my little brother, man, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that he had something insane. Even though he had great songs on that album. Yeah. But I wanted something because I Smash. knew three were coming strong with him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, wish. I just wanted to make sure. And it wasn't just me, but we wanted to make sure, all of us wanted to make sure that Big was going to be right, you know? Answer me this, though, Sleep. Seeing them as two young high school boys coming up to y'all freestyling. Did y'all envision them going out as the greatest of all time? <laughs> I, I, I got to be true for you. I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, when they first came over, they, they freestyled like 30 minutes, <laughs> going back and forth. And I looked at Reed like, ah, damn, are they going to stop? <laughs> I like it, but when they going to stop? And Reed was like, okay, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Now, Rico was the one who truly felt I think Reek might have seen that first. Yeah. You know, that's just the truth. He uh he always just he felt like that about them. Yeah. And uh once they started coming around and we all got to know them and and then we were here cuz like every night we would make them or Reek would make them sit around in front of everybody and and you know every night they had to write something every day. And you know just seeing their uh, determination and how much how bad they wanted it like we used to we basically had like boot camp around there for them, man. We used to make them jog around the house, saying they rhymes and shit, <laughs> making sure they got their breath together. Like, yeah. you know, so in a way, we wanted them to be the best. And yeah. when they became the best, it was, I looked at really like, damn, did we know <laughs> they were going to be the best, the best like this? <laughs> you know, so it's, man, it's, I, I say that all the time. I said, bro, do y'all know we actually put out the guys? that everybody considers the best rap duo of all time. It's My a, God. That's amazing, bro. From Atlanta, from a place, from a city that most cities wouldn't even look at us, man. Like, it was so hard for us to make it in New York at first. It was ridiculous. But we did it. You know? Talk about breaking through, though, Sleepy, because a lot of folks didn't break through, okay? Right. And y'all were able to do so, man. So also I want to know about just the synergy and the energy between all of y'all coming together for that common goal. How much of a difference did it make having that many damn people sticking together and really being a family about it? Yeah, that, that, that's what made it work. Um mm. One thing about the Dungeon family, we always believed. We knew we had talent. We knew we knew what we had. It just we waiting for that moment. So when the face records came down, I remember we started working on the album and I remember like Ray would be in the studio and Wish Doctor dropped by or um uh CeeLo dropped by and they'll just put a verse on something that will make it into this incredible record. So mm. I would say this, the Southern Playalistic album really wasn't Outkast's first album. That was the Dungeon Family's first album. Because if you listen to it, you hear everybody on it. Yeah. And everybody contribute to that album. Now, Outkast's first album was AT Aliens. Mm. The true 
when they really found themselves and knew where they were going, you know what I'm saying? So as a crew, man, we always knew that what we had was super special. We just, we were waiting on that moment. Mm -hmm. And we knew when we got that moment, we weren't gonna let it go. To see where Atlanta's at now, from that time, you also got the greatest group of all time, but now you got an action-packed, power-playing city out of it as well. Everybody came to the ATL after you done shouted out all of those places on them songs, looking for them places, right. trying to turn up. Right. Black Hollywood is happening now. Yes, what sir. goes through your mind when you're thinking about Camerton Road is that two-lane street, then next thing you know it's four lanes, and now you can't find nowhere to live in Atlanta? I know. It's crazy. <laughs> um, I'll say this, you know, it's funny, man, because I was talking to my dad. My dad was in a uh, big band um, in the 70s called Brick, had a yes, lot sir. of hits. And uh, he used to tell me, like, I didn't know how hard Camerton Road was jumping back in his day because <laughs> that's where they went, him, SOS band, they all were friends, and they were all trying to get on. Yeah. So it just reminds me of what we did for Camerton Road, why, it's, why Atlanta and Camerton Road is like that now. Like, it's, it's, it's packed in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I wish it wasn't so packed all the damn traffic, <laughs> but I do love the fact that, you know, Atlanta artists, Atlanta music was the reason for people to believe in Atlanta. They wanted to come here and look for something great because it was always the rumor that, you know, you can come to Atlanta, get a lot of land, a big house for cheap. <laughs> yeah. That was always known. <laughs> yeah. It still, it brought them out a little bit, but not really. But once they start hearing the soundtrack of Atlanta from us, from Jermaine, from Dallas, Started hearing all these different things. They were like, shh, let me go to A. And they yeah. started thinking, you know, in Atlanta, it's so black. And it's a lot of opportunities out here for black people. Yeah. Which is true. Which is true. So, you know, by being those things, man, I, you know, I love Atlanta, man, forever. With your daddy being a part of Brick and having that point of reference to that success, man, what was that like talking to your peers saying, hey, man, this can really happen for us, too? I didn't have to say it to them. I think they already knew it. It's, okay. It, it was something that we just, for some reason, man, we used to be kind of conceited because we <laughs> knew we were going to make it. You know what I'm saying? We were so self-contained. Yeah. You know, and and everything. Like, it, it, it's crazy. I remember one time, man, my boy was telling me how, you know, other producers from Atlanta felt that we didn't make them a part of it. Mm. And it wasn't that we were trying to keep people out. We were just so self-contained from the beginning. Yeah. That... That's just how it was ran, you know what I mean? Man, it, you know, like, I, I I love Atlanta. I love everything about Atlanta. I love all the sound of Atlanta. I love the food from Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. <laughs> Can't wait with Andre, man. Ah. Another banger. Yes, sir. How did y'all bring that thing together? I, when, uh, when, when we did the song, me and Rico did the song. Mm -hmm. uh, I was almost done with my album. And I said to myself, I'm like, I had to go do a show with Outkast that weekend. So we were getting ready to get on the plane. And that's back when we had, the, that's when everybody still had the CD players with the yeah. phone. So right before we got on the plane, I said, here, Dre. I said, listen to the album. I said, tell me what song you like, which one you want to get on. I knew he was going to love Can't Wait. I knew that was going to be the one. <laughs> so time we got off the plane, he looked at me, he said, sleep, man. As soon as we get back, I got a verse. I got you. As soon as we got back to Atlanta, man. Well, actually, he went back to Atlanta earlier, like a day earlier. And my boy Moan, Bunny Moan from Organized, well, from the Dungeon family, yeah. one of our brothers from the beginning. Um, Moan went to the studio. He was doing a verse. And Moan hit me like, man. Like, Dre just put it. <laughs> Dre just... <laughs> He said, bro, Dre just killed this verse. I'm like, really? He said, yeah, it's long, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, cool, man. So when we heard the verse, it was like, wow. We couldn't shorten it. We couldn't do nothing to it. I had to shorten my hook yeah, just so we can make sure he have his and to put Big on the end. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, like, he killed it so bad, man. It was like, good God. <laughs> like, I appreciate that, Dre. You, <laughs> woo. You put down one of your classes on my shit, and I love it. How do you feel having so many damn classics up under your belt, though, man? Because, you know, when you think about organized noise, when you think about Sleepy Brown, we talking about the timeless music. So, I mean, you know, some folks are happy if they just got one sleep. That's true. I don't know about your head one. Come on. I ain't going to lie. But, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It, it feels great, man. It's, you know, 
I feel like about how my dad felt. I ain't gonna lie to you. Like uh, when Brighead ain't gonna hurt nobody. Dance mm. and we don't want to sit down and get down and do it. When they had all them hits and every year they came out, they had a yeah. number one. It was just you know, it was amazing. So you know, my dad called me one day. He said, he's like Patrick. I'm gonna tell you something. He said one day. He said all the songs you got. He said one day you're gonna have one record that you're gonna be able to do for the rest of your life. Woo! And I said okay. And then next month. The way you move came out. <laughs> Cause for him, it's dance. I don't care what my dad do. Long as he does dance, yeah. the crowd go nuts still to this day. It's amazing. When you think about the way you move, man, and where that's taking you and big all over the world, what is it like performing that song and then your music in general all over the damn world? Feels amazing, bro. I can't lie. You know, when and, you know, when you go to Japan, they sing the words with you, or when you go you know what I'm saying? Anywhere, and they just they know the word and they smiling at you. It's like if it's a it feel it's a great feeling of you made it, bro. Like you know the 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 fact that I went on um, the Outcast 20 um, anniversary tour, yeah, and went to Budapest and was smoking weed in Budapest, bro. I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I like look what this music done got me. It done got me over here in this country smoking weed, bro. <laughs> Under a tree, looking at these giant bats Come on. that's flying over a church. How crazy is that? So I'm, I'm still amazed, man. You know, you know, with me and Big, we might, we did a little something. We went to um, Australia and, and, and Melbourne, bro, and they knew everything over there. And we were just like, wow, it don't stop. My God, it don't stop, man. The fame and the celebrity that came along with it, though, Sleepy, how did that impact you when y'all became world-renowned in this thing? Well, back in the day, it messed me up because, you know, no one can get used to the fame. I'm going to say that. Yeah. Nobody can. Once you get it, it's like a drug, bro. You get addicted to it. So, you know, it's, it definitely was fun. I had, I definitely had fun, but I definitely made mistakes. I definitely spent too much money in the strip club. <laughs> Way too much money in the strip club. It's ridiculous. I'm surprised they ain't got no damn picture of me when you walk in the damn door. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I'm, I've, I've messed up my marriage. I did all kind of dumb stuff, man. But, you know, it's all a lesson. And, you know, you have to learn, bro. Fame is a big, hard, it's the more, more, more hardcore drug than heroin, bro. Fame will have you crazy, bro, in a corner just shaking. <laughs> Wonder why ain't nobody <laughs> like you no more. <laughs> How did you take a chill pill then from fame? I had to, had to sit my ass down, you know. Yeah. I had to sit my ass down and try to get myself together. Man, I had about five, five, or six years where I was just off the chain. I didn't give a damn about nothing. I was staying in California. I was dating all kind of races of women, you know. I was just off the chain, bro. I wasn't doing no music. I was just, I was just like, you know what? Because I, I got so pissed off at the music business mm. that I said, you know what, man? Forget this. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's just what it was. And I did that for a while. And then, of course, music comes back to you. And it comes back to your heart. And, and you know, I got to thank um, Orlando McGee, uh, Organized Noise. Yes, sir. He basically... Um, well, basically, what he did was brought us back from the dead because mm. the idea of wanting to do the um, the documentary, documentary was all his idea. My you know God. what I'm saying? And when he came to us with it, and it finally came together, that's what got organized noise back in everybody's faces. Mm -hmm. Was that documentary? So I, I the really documentary was hard it. as hell, though. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate Lando for that and putting that together and helping us. You know, helping his, his big brothers come back. Them five years where you was just living how you wanted to live, though, did you feel like you was free at that time? Was there any happiness in them five years of just cutting up and having a damn good time? Shit. I mean, it was it it was fun. It wasn't happiness, but it was fun. <laughs> okay, it was definitely fun. It wasn't a lot of happiness. <laughs> it was happy moments, you know. But I had to, you know, it, it was something. I guess I had to get out of my system and go through. Yeah, everybody does, bro. So, in great times and bad times, I just went through everything, and I think that's why I appreciate. I had to go through that to appreciate what came back. Yeah, you know, because this is like the second coming of organized noise in the Dungeon family, and and you know, 
especially me, man, being with Big. Big looked out for Big Bro and, yeah. you know, shit, did a group and now I got some stuff coming out, bro. This is amazing to me. I'm like, wow. Can you speak to Big and him holding down the family as well, though, man, and just keeping the party going? Man, Big, a lot of people don't know, but Big, man, is is one of the most sweetest, greatest souls you ever want to meet, man. This guy will bend over backwards for anybody in his family, man. And he wanted to make sure that we, like he, Big used to fight for me all the time. Like on the way you move, LA wanted to put Usher on there instead Ooh. of me. Big told him, now nah, keep him sleeping on them. Damn right. You feel what I'm saying? Big has always had my back. So when we were talking about doing this group and I saw him more excited than I was, I knew it was gonna be special. Yeah. Cause it it, 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 it sparked something in him again. You know, mm. I, I know Big loves to be a solo artist and everything like that, but I know he misses his brother Dre. Yeah. I know he misses those times being on stage. Cause that's how, man, them brothers, they came to us when they were 16, 17, man. They came out as kids, you know what I'm saying? They didn't come out like in their late 20s. They yeah. came out as kids, so you know, it's little, little brother missing little brother. So I know this group kind of fills that hole a little bit, yeah. not all the way, but just a little bit to know that he got somebody up there that got his back. And yeah. Having, and got his back and we having fun and we ain't gonna let nobody destroy what we got, you know come what I'm on. saying? Cause we got that kind of bond, so. You know, I know for B, when I saw him get more excited than I did, because I was super excited about this shit. <laughs> I'm like, thank you, bro. Thank you for helping my old ass. I appreciate this. I need this, bro, bro. Let's get it. But he was like, shit, I got you. Like, this goes. Yeah. So, you know, and he, you know, he, he's he been on it so hard as far as promoting it. And, bro, my, my little brother pushing it, bro. I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but the album is jamming like a mug, though, too, Appreciate man. That's Appreciate the thing that's so crazy about it. It's some of that music that we've been waiting on. So when you well, hear it, it, it was feel easy good. to do. It was easy to do because it's me and him. You okay. know what I'm saying? Like we know from doing from doing it so many years, we we can't help but do them kind of songs. Uh, you know what I mean? And it all started when we first did Claiming True because Claiming yeah. True. That's when I really found out how super dope he was as a writer. Damn, now, he wrote that hook, and I'm like. I looked at him like, okay, okay, little bro. You know, so my, my respect for him went up even higher when yeah. he wrote Ain't No Thing. When he when he stole, saw that to me, I was like, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> you know, both of us, we just, we're, we're a matching spirit, man. Both of us Aquarius. And you know what I'm saying? We're, we're, we connect so well when it comes to music because we're weirdos. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we are, man, Aquarius, we are some weird brothers. Yeah. So. You know, I, I, that's how. That's why I feel like it works so well. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because big, I can play a beat for big, big can feel it. Like we'll do some stuff sometimes. It's, it's some songs that didn't make the album. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That I felt like would have been more special for him. Yeah, because he got a record that that's gonna take him when he drops. Once he gets ready to do his next solo album, he has a record that is just fucking insane. It's gonna kill the world. Oh my god! But I felt like that was special for him. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so with this album, man, the songs that we do have, you know, we, we, we really made sure that they were jamming. We really, we didn't just jump on something just because somebody gave us a beat. Yeah. But you know, we got a chance to work with 1500, those guys, Point Guard, yeah. 1500, KI, uh, really dope artists. Um, you know, just everybody, you know, Kill on the Mic. Yeah. And, uh, Scotty, Scotty ATL. ATL, yeah, what boy. up, though, Scotty? Yes, sir. Scotty yeah. Scotty on the, on, the, on the record. He on a cold, cold, sexy record called Do Your Best For Me. <laughs> All right, now, Scotty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it that that album, you know, we 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 just, we made sure it was jamming, man. And, um, oh, big shout out to uh, It's Cows that did the record Animal. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah, we just, we, we picked we pick each record and we just made sure that it was like, okay. We, Cause we knew we couldn't make no young, young album. It was yeah. sounding crazy. Was trying to do that, but see, it's OG music, man. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's all I've been screaming the whole time. That's what the streets need. That's the new genre of music. It is OG music. We got right. OG Kush. Can we get the music Can to go we get with the it, music please? Go with it. Yeah, they just My call. God. You know what they call it? They call it grown rap. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they call it. Grown see, that ain't rap. sexy Contem though. That ain't sexy. That ain't sexy. Contemporary <laughs> rap. That's what no. you might want to call it. But you're right. OG music. Come it on. should be called OG. It should be. Okay, it makes more sense. Even in darkness, when y'all got the whole family back together, 
What was that like putting that album out with all hands on deck? That was fun because everybody knew what they had to do. And uh that that was totally fun. We did a um we did a like a two week tour of the Dungeon family like maybe about four months ago, four or five months ago. Yeah. And that was incredible. Like the response we got from that was amazing. That album, man, we we um we love that album, and we we all wanted that album to jump. You know, we really wanted it to be special because that was kind of like the first Dungeon Family. You know, what yeah. I'm saying? that was that was your chance to hit everybody on one album. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So for for some for fans, they love it. I wish we did better as far as chart wise or whatever like that. But whatever, as long as the fans love it, I don't give a damn. Yeah. Trans DF Express, man, that's another one of those songs that just kind of touched close to my heart. Putting that banger together. That was that 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 was funny cuz that was kind of funny cuz it kind of came really simple. We just um kind of did that. the beat was going and I just went up there and started playing. Dun, 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 dun. I just started playing it. Dun, 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 dun. Bing 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 bing. <laughs> and they were like, "That's cool right now. We ain't really had nothing else to it." I was like, "All right, well, forget. It. Let's get it." Yeah. So, came up with the hook. That was a really that that song happened really quick. Mm-hmm. Really, I think that might have been the first song we did for the Dungeon Family album. Oh hell no! I believe so. I believe that might have been the first recording. Another banger. Saturday, ludicrous. Ah. That's one of those ones right there as well, man. Yes, sir. Sticky, iggy, iggy, iggy. Yes, sir. Uh, Shouts out to Ludacris, man. He um, he always showed love to organize and always came over to get a song. And Reek had that beat going. And um, he told Reek about the idea he had with Saturday. He was like, man, I just want to sleep and come in and go, <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> I'm like, cool. <laughs> so one of my favorite little Chris songs that I did with him was Blueberry Yum Yum. Okay. That one right now. Yeah, yeah. I like, to, I like to play that when I got me that. You know what I'm saying? A little something about to burn up. <laughs> What about that popping tags with Jay Z though? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that's me on that record. That's funny. Yep, popping tags, man. That was something that uh, he had reached out to Big. Kanye did the beat. He reached out to Big and told Big he kind of wanted that outcast feel on it. So that meant he wanted me to sing the hook. Yeah. Instead of saying, yeah, can you get sleep to sing it? I need that outcast feel. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, that's how popping tags came to be. I just really sung with. Uh, Kanye had already wrote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When it came to working outside of the dungeon with different artists, what were those experiences like when you would get a Jay-Z or you would get a Ludacris and stuff like that or TLC for that fact, you know, just working with outside folks? I mean, you know, it, it was pretty cool because we always gave them, gave them our formula. We didn't, you know, that was the thing about it. They wanted us to do what we were already doing. They didn't say, you know, well, we need some kind of like this or that. They would just follow Mm-hmm. So you know when we would work with somebody, they would be open and and you know to work with whatever we did. So that was just kind of cool. That it never was really a problem. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, at all. Like especially like you know my my boy Marquez, that's a part of a uh, Dungeon Family, one of the originals, uh, singer, yes, sir. songwriter. He wrote Waterfalls, and you know like. Sh- when we time we heard it, we knew it was like something special. We called T Boz. We all friends. Like, can you come up and sing this right quick? And she came right up and sung it. That's how the record made the album. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you know, it's it, it's. I'm not gonna say it's always easy to work with somebody. You know, um, outside of the crew, but we always make it work. Talk to me about just that Atlanta and those three degrees of separation from every damn body growing up together and then everybody experiencing massive success. What was that like going into the music industry and seeing folks that you went to high school with kin to just as successful as yourself? Uh, It was really great, but one thing I said to Rico about it, um, when everybody got their houses and stuff and we we were still working, I said, man, what's missing is us being in that house. You know, once you get money and everything, you know, you start families and stuff, things change, man. It's a whole new outlook on what we were doing before. Yeah. But uh, I told Rick, I said, man, that it didn't mess anything up, but I said, man, we really need that old house vibe back. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was nothing like it to go over there, bro, and there's everybody sitting on the steps and everybody right. Yeah. That was it. It was like a school, man. Mm-hmm. Like a dirty, smoked out school. <laughs> Talk to me about when the money came in and all of that time leading up to it, working for the money. When you finally see the money, what did that do to your mind and how did that change everything? Well, man, it drove me crazy. 
<laughs> oh, I went and started going to strip club. That, that would fuck me up. <laughs> you know, um, being in Atlanta, getting money and getting a big house. Man, I had, man, I had got a Holyfield first house. Woo. And his first uh, wife had Paulette. I bought that house. It was four stories. My God. I had bought a Benz with AMG kid on it, and red candy apple, peanut butter. Like Pimp said, why? With that top back, last freak nigga, 94, I think. Man, I was acting a fool. That money was, man, it, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. You know what I'm saying? But money will do that, you know? Because at first, you know, we all in the house and call a girl up to give us some money, get a piece of, yeah. get her to buy us, all of us hamburgers or something. And then they go from that to meeting LaFace, to meeting L.A. Reed and Pebbles, and they taking us to these nice restaurants, you know what I'm saying? I'm in the order, everybody order steaks and stuff, and I'm ordering a hamburger, cause I don't know no better. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm still me, so I'm in the, yeah, let me get a cheeseburger, and they like, Nigga. You don't want nothing else? I'm like, I don't know what this, this shit is. <laughs> Better cheat. I ain't never had that shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So money came along, man. It it it, it helped us grow and, and grow up and figure stuff out and pay bills and everything. But boy, it came with something else too. It, you know, it came with that power. It came with everybody wanting a piece of you and what you want. You know what I mean? So money is money. But dealing with that power and everybody wanted a piece of sleepy though, cause see that's the other side of it too. You know, yeah. we understand the spending part, but what about the responsibility of trying to maintain friendships and relationships with all of this new damn money? Yeah, friendships go fast, bro. Cause you know, and I'm gonna say this, if I got it, my friend got it, definitely. But that don't mean take advantage of it, my dude. I mean, damn, like, of course I got you. I promise you, you will never starve. You will never be homeless, my bro, but I am not your father. <laughs> Point blank, period. <laughs> if you feel like I'm your daddy, you out your mind, <laughs> big nigga. <laughs> <laughs> go, get, go do what you gotta do. That's always been my thing. I have no problem with helping anybody, and I will to the end of time, but boy, do not take advantage of that. No. Know your limits and know what you can do. You know what I'm saying? Don't don't ever come at somebody. I know that you might have grew up with a person, and I get it. But don't come at them like they owe you that. They don't owe you shit. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? They just got lucky. You know what I'm oh. saying? Now, if you're a friend, support your friend no matter what. Your friend going to have your back. But that don't mean, goddamn... And we go to strip club, you expect me to give you $2,000, bro. I'm like, bro, I just spent 4000 for both of us. What you talking about? Come on. Why you think you got all 15, 20,000 of them goddamn dances? <laughs> you ain't paid for nothing. And now you want two Gs? Boy, I get, boy go on. Go Come on. Go on with that, bye. <laughs> go on with that. I'm that. old school, though, but I mean, these days, I'm going to say something. These young Gs spend money, boy. Yeah. They spend money, and I get it. If you got hundreds of millions like that, you want your crew to have, I mean, you know, have $10,000 a piece, that's fine. I've done that too. Yeah. But I can't do that all the time. And I'm not going to do that all the time. Thanks. You know what I'm saying? Because I have to make sure I'm straight. If I'm straight, then we all straight. If it's, I take care of everybody and I ain't straight, come on. Where we going to get money at? Ain't nobody coming to the pole house to see you. Yeah. Ain't, <laughs> shit. Ain't nobody coming to see me and bring me no sandwich. <laughs> They want to see. They want to meet me at the at the goddamn at the at City eating the Wayne, so they can get some Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking shit. Bro. Uh, I'm with you. <laughs> UGK swishes and herb, yep. working with the underground kings, man. Can you speak on that? First of all, I like to give much love and shout out to Chad, man, Pimp C. Yes, sir. I miss him. Um, Bun B as well. Um, I had so, a chance, when, when Pimp moved to Atlanta, I had a chance to really meet him and hang out with him, and we became really best friends to the point where um, he helped me produce Sleepy Thing. Mm. Um, I helped him. We actually produced uh, Look At Me, Motherfucker, Look At Me, at my house, <laughs> and uh, on, on these DAT, these, these ADAT machines, and because I had four of them, he had four of them, yeah. and uh, I, I co-produced that with him at the house. If you listen to it on the keys, that's me. My God. Uh, so me and Pimp, man, we had the kind of relationship that we would just, man, you couldn't separate us. 
So when it came to that, he always loved the song Peaches and Herb. He would tell me every day, man, I gotta do some of that Peaches and Herb. I was like, man, whatever you wanna do, I don't care, it's cool. Then he came up with Switches and Herb. I said, fine, let's get it. Cause I, you know, he loved the record so much, I just wanted to do whatever he wanted. It was, yep. it was cool with me, you know what I'm saying? So we've always had that kind of relationship, man, that kind of love for each other. So, you know, once again, man, Pimp, uh, when Pimp was in my life, bro, Pimp did a lot of special things for me uh, that people don't even know, bro. Can you speak on the creative side of it, though, with both of y'all being producers and singers at the same time? Let me tell you something, man. It was, I was, a, I, I'm still a fan. I was the biggest Pimp C fan. So when I finally got a chance to see him work, bro, let me tell you something. That's one of the coldest, most funkiest moments you ever want to see somebody produce. For somebody to hit a sample and feel it so much that they start rocking like this. <laughs> oh! That's it right there, sleep. Oh! What the, what the being wanted, tell them what the whole want. Boy, I'm sitting there like, come up with the whole song. My God. Man, Pimp was untouchable, bro. Like, I still use some of his techniques on how I produce. <laughs> oh. he, he's insane, man. He, he was insane. He was so funky. I always told him, I said, bro, if you did a singing album, I would, I would have a problem. See that? It would be a problem for me because my dude, we just alike. Like, we, I told him, I said, we need to do a singing album together. We're going to do a lot of stuff together that we didn't get a chance to do. What goes through your mind when you think about all of the plans that folks be having and then for somebody to pass, unfortunately, like that, when you had plans with people, man? I know, it hurt, bro. And the first of all, it really hurt because he passed and how he passed. It was terrible. So, you know, what was crazy, he had called me two days before because we were going to do, like, another production team called the 808 Boys. Mm. And I was going to move to California with him. Yeah. And uh, he was like, yeah, man, so I got the place. I got this. We're going to have this. I'm going to have you come out in about five days. I said, cool, man. And two days later, bro, I got a call from Ray saying he passed. My God. Yeah, early in the morning. Uh, early call from Ray. And uh, it was terrible, bro. But we had a lot of plans together. When you think about this music industry and just maneuvering it and, and staying alive, because like you say, when you had the time of your life during that time, yeah. how the hell did you keep from dying? Man, I had a, a, a angel on my side, bro. I ain't going to lie to you. Um, I always felt protected. No matter what I did, I, for some reason I could have a feeling and I would just know if something bad about to go down. It was just a gift. I don't know. It might sound crazy, but it is so true. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Every time something would go down, I would have a feeling that I need to leave. So yeah. that would that was the thing that would save me. I was trusting my gut. Always. I didn't care, no, I didn't care what was going down. <laughs> During them times back in the day when you look up, Tupac dies and then Biggie dies. How did right. that impact y'all down here in the A when you seeing that kind of stuff? Man, we on? were in Cali when Biggie died. Because we were having a party, Outcast had a party, on uh, Sunset. Mm. And Biggie was actually getting ready to come over there. But what happened was, because everything stops, everything stops at 2. So once the party stopped, we started hearing the rumors that Biggie got shot. We were like, what? And then some people were like, that's not true, it's not true. But some people were like, it's really true. He like, he's, he, he's at the hospital, he's dying. So the next morning when we saw it, man, we were just, I was, I was shocked, you know what I mean? Because I couldn't believe it. But I can't lie, I had a feeling that it was weird for him to be in California yeah. at that time. Because I wouldn't have done that to my artist. I yeah. don't give a damn. What the hell we promote? Yeah. If it's that much danger, I'm not going to take you to the jungle. Expect that we going to have a good time and everything. No, 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 no. I was shocked that it happened. I couldn't believe it, bro. I couldn't believe when Pac got, got shot. You know what I'm saying? It was a sad thing. And then to see the movie uh, about Pac when he when he got killed, this yeah. scene, we didn't know that he was playing Blackberry Molasses. But I missed the record that we did. He sitting in the car fussing with Shug. No, nah, that's, that's the record. Shug, like, I don't like this. He's like, no, nah, no. Nah. It was crazy. Tupac wanted to be in Goody Mob. When Tupac was locked up, <laughs> no, this is a true story. When Tupac was locked up, yeah. he had sent a letter to Timo saying he wanted to be a part of Goody Mob. My God. He loved us, bro. 
Rico talked to him. We posted a hook over Tupac when him and Suge was starting um, um, Death Row South. Yeah. South. yeah, Death Row South. They were talking about on MTV. Yeah, he was talking to us. You know what I'm saying? Like Pac loved Dungeon Family. He loved us, bro. We loved him too. My so we God. were hurt. We were hurting both of them, Pac. We know both of them so well. I love Biggie, man. I love Biggie, and it, it, it hurt when he got shot. It, like, it was terrible. Living through all of that stuff and seeing how time represents those people and those characters now, how do you feel like the person versus the legend matches up? It's always different, man. You won't meet when you when you meet. Uh, a certain entertainer that's that considered a legend or everybody thinks he's a certain way, he's always different. Yeah. Pac wasn't only time Pac got rowdy is when you fuck with him. Yeah. He was on some cool shit, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And only time you heard about him exploding is when there's somebody fucking with him or doing something to him or did something to him. And that's that's with everybody. Yeah. But other than that, man, Pac was cool as fuck, man. He was a nice guy. My God. Biggie was a super nice guy. They were cool as hell, man. It wasn't Dude, it, it, when I was around, I ain't never seen nothing crazy, nothing. You know what I'm saying? It was always good. It was cool. You know? That Source Awards, the South got something to say, man. Oh, yeah. I wasn't there, to tell you the truth. When you saw that going down, though. When I when I saw them get booed, uh -huh. I knew. See, New York, man. New York finally showed us love. But at first, bro, New York City couldn't stand us. Mm. We were like the slow, we were like the slow country ass cousin yeah. that they would come down and see. Couldn't stand to be around them, but had fun with them. Yeah. You know them. Yeah. So they couldn't stand us. So I knew we were gonna get booed. Yeah. Cause we were first of all we were in this 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 predicament between North and South battling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we in the middle of it like yeah. this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know it. It's something that shouldn't even happen, man. Yeah. It shouldn't even went down that way, truthfully. Like, Shug shouldn't have said that at the, so you can say what the fuck you want to say, but for you to say it in New York City that bold, bro, you crazy. You a trip. In New York, you know, New York never, <laughs> New York finally started showing us love, I would say, around Aquimini. Mm. That's when the love really started coming in from New York City. My God, it that's took, three albums in. Bro, it took that long. It took that long. And I'm going to tell you why. Because, okay, first album, the source said, oh, this is a really good album. We only going to get you four and a half. And you better be glad you got that because you're some little South niggas and we're not going to give you five mics. Yeah. By the time Equipment I came out, five mics. Yeah. Couldn't deny it. Come on. You got to give it up. So that's when they that's when they really start showing us love. We would get love from execs in New York and certain rappers, yeah. but on the low, they wouldn't just <laughs> we fucking hey, with them. Yeah. We fuck with them. Yeah. But on the low, they fuck with us. Over time, I wish that love came in. So I remember, I remember uh, we did the tunnel with Cool Breeze, and then we did Watch for the Hook, mm. and the tunnel was known in New York as like. The most gutter yeah. underground hip hop club ever. Oh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm with you. So we go in now, Cool Breeze performing, start doing Watch for the Hook. Dre walks up on that stage with them colorful big ass pants. <laughs> and when I tell you, that fucking crowd went nuts. And I stood in the back like, oh my God, New York love us. <laughs> they finally love us. You know yeah. what I'm saying? They loved us so much that we had to perform it twice. <laughs> it was crazy, so that's that. It took New York a while to finally come around and say, "Okay, okay, we'll give it up. Y'all, y'all dope. Y'all dope. Y'all doing y'all thing," and that's all we ever wanted. Cause we looked up to them. We were little. Answer me this though, Sleepy. When Dre started exploring with the clothing and stuff like that, how much hell did he catch out of the home team when he had got away from the jerseys and the regular clothing? I'm gonna tell you like this: We on a video shoot of Skewer on the Bar. Mm -hmm. um, we we going we shot the video down at the Tabernacle and mm. we all backstage and it's the whole family all of us back there in the hallway just talking just talking and Dre in the dressing room so Dre walks out of the dressing room <laughs> <laughs> and Dre got in the white wig 
This is the first time we've seen it. The white wig, got the white arm bands, you got the white shorts, got the ski boots. <laughs> and he walked out and everybody looked at him and it just got so quiet. <laughs> You can hear a pin drop, bro. It was quiet for about three minutes. My God. And then he walked back in the room, and everybody turned around and just started back talking. Like, it, it was just the craziest thing. So Rico asked him how he felt. And then I said, with Dre, you know, how do you feel, bro? You, are you, like, like, you know, you, you about to show them something totally different. And he's yeah. like, man, either they with me. He said, either they going to laugh at me or we going to kill this. Ooh. And by him giving that confidence and telling me that, I said, oh, you finna kill it, man. <laughs> because the thing to me, what I saw from it at first is Dre looked, I, when I first seen him, I said, I said to myself, I said, man, Dre look like George Clinton. Mm. This look like some parliament shit. Yeah. It don't look like no, you know, everybody trying to say is he on some gay shit or whatever. Yeah. No, 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 no. Dre was on funky. some funky parliament shit. Yeah, I saw it. You know what I'm saying? I never asked him about because I ain't want to confuse him with it. I ain't want him to mm. think. I just kept my mouth shut. But to me, he all, it always looked like George Clinton. So I was like, okay, if he George Clinton, I'm about to be boosting. <laughs> so I went and got them big jackets. I had got some stack boots. They got them tall. They made yeah. me about got them seven nine. <laughs> but I want them motherfuckers in New York City at a show, but them girls thought I was that tall for real. <laughs> Wilt the still. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So I saw it, and I knew that this is about to make us Funkadelic and Parliament of the South. I knew exactly what it was when My I see him dressed like that. But I knew Big wasn't going to do it. Yeah. So Big going to keep his style and do it his way. Big has worn some outrageous stuff, but on some real pimp shit. Yeah. Truthfully. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, But I knew that's what it's going to look like. As soon as I seen his outfit, bro, I said, wow, he like George fucking Clinton. Crazy. That shit hard as hell. <laughs> I mean, actually looked like him, bro. I was like, wow. I felt like I was in a time zone. I was like, this nigga like he from the land of mothership. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> uh, with you. Organized base uh, with Kilo. 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 That was a damn good ass album. Yeah, but the Talk world just me. was not ready for that sound or that style. They were not ready. We used to get into it with Interscope so bad about Kilo because they did not understand what the hell that was. It was nobody. It was Atlanta like it. 2020. It was Atlanta. That's what I'm saying. They, but they just they did not understand him because this was before Auto Tune. Yeah. So what he was saying, it would just be everywhere. This yeah. Was, it, nobody got it except for Atlanta. Yeah. We loved it. We loved it. Classic album. Love in your mouth came off of that album. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Baby, this, baby. I'm gonna tell you something so funny when when we did the Dungeon Family uh, thing at uh. One one music fest, yeah, and Kilo was performing, and his his I don't know what happened, but his sound cut off, and he was doing in your mouth. When I tell you all the girls, every lady in that place sung every lyric, and everybody was just like, "What the what?" The? <laughs> the? <laughs> I mean, they love that song. They love that record. So you know, at you know with Kilo, it it's a shame because. It didn't happen the way it was supposed to happen. It should really should have been. I mean, it, it's still a classic, and people still talk about it. They still play it to this day. And, you know, Kilo himself, you know what I'm saying? I wish he was a little more focused mm. and not so, you know, headstrong on thinking we trying to, you know, do something dirty to him. Like, no, fool. Like, we bought you everything you want. Anything you wanted, you got. You made other artists jealous on our label. Mm. But we looked out for you because you were a classic, legendary artist. Yep. You just didn't act the part. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? You over here just cussing folk out and telling Dre you want to battle him in a rap. I said, boy, if you don't sit your head down somewhere. You actually walked up to Dre. Dre, I ain't want to battle you. <laughs> Kilo. I'm like, boy, if you don't sit your collard green ass somewhere, not your mind, fool. But that's Kilo. Yeah. That's what made him classy. That's what made him a star. He was the most cockiest son of a bitch you ever want to meet. Talk to me about having that label on Interscope. What was that like when y'all had the reins in y'all hand and it was time for y'all to do what y'all need to do? It was hard, man, because the one thing we had with the face records is we had LA that understood us. Yeah. Even if he didn't, he would say he did. 
You know what I'm saying? Jimmy yeah. Iovine knew. Jimmy Iovine, when he ain't get it, you ain't getting shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. He'll sit there, I don't get this. I don't get this. He kept saying that about Kilo. I don't get this. I don't get this. But I knew the reason why, because he wanted Cool Breeze out first. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? But Cool Breeze wasn't done. Damn. Cool Breeze still working. So we try to give him this and give him uh, Lil' Will looking for Nikki. And they didn't get looking for Nikki. They, 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 we try to show him. Cause we leaked the record, so we trying to show him the plays in Atlanta that it's getting. Like this yeah. record is blowing up, crazy. And they still were just like, "Well, now nah, we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get it." So to me, it was a very hard deal because it was hard to work with him. I have nothing but respect for Jimmy Iovine mean, all day, but it just didn't match. It, it, it he didn't get us. We didn't get him. Yeah, L.A. understood us. Well, L.A. you know because. L.A. had a chance to see us grow from doing hip hop to doing waterfalls. He's yeah. like, he, he blown wrong. away. Yeah. Like y'all can do that too. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He understood us and was willing to be more open with us. Jimmy, nah. You had to make it idiot proof for Jimmy. And when I say idiot proof, I mean most record labels they like idiot proof records. Yeah, it make it easy for them to work. Yeah. Oh, we get that. Boom, put it out. Put money behind it. If it's something that's a little different risky. and they don't get it and it's yeah. too risky, uh-uh, bro. They don't, don't waste no money on that. Industry politics from that side, man, what was that like trying to navigate that? Hard, man. It's, 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 you know, like I said, Interscope Records, that was a hard deal because the the thing that came out of it, we, some good success came out of it. You know, if, 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 know what I'm saying? As far as Cool Breeze, he did sell pretty good. Wish Dollar did do pretty good. Um, but it could have been so much more better if it was more understanding or more. Jimmy gave us freedom to do what we want to do. Mm. But he wanted waterfalls. Mm. And what he didn't understand, we were the type of producers that we don't go back. Ooh. We move forward. Yeah, We do different shit all the time. So that was the conflict with him. Yeah. Plus, I had this sleepy theme at the time. And played Sleepy Thing for him. He didn't like it. So I dropped it as an independent. And he got pissed. And I'm like, well, I played this <laughs> for you. You did not like it. So you think I'm just going to throw something on the shelf because you don't like it? Yeah. Shout out from the A, man. I would play this motherfucker like the ring every weekend at from 6 to 7. Whatever. <laughs> Period. You know what I'm saying? He got pissed. We lost the deal over them. You feel, you feel what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't Rico file. He was mad at me. Damn. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Understood. Okay, cool. So from there, but we had success with with uh, with Sylvia Rome as far as doing set it off and all this stuff. Yeah. So we was in a good place and all these things, but it just did not work with him, man. It, it, it didn't work because he did not understand us and we didn't understand him. We didn't understand, because we were young, we didn't understand the format of what Interscope wanted. Being that young at the time with all of that money and power, what was your mind at at that time, having to boss up? Because how old was you at that time? It would be like 27. Okay, you still a kid. Yeah. 27 years old Yeah. with millions of dollars on the line and right. you just creative than the motherfucker out here in these streets. To, and we trying to figure out what does Interscope truly want and what's going to make them happy. And at the same time, we trying to keep our artists happy. At the same time, we trying to... It was just a bunch of shit, man. It's, you know, I, I would say this. To anybody that wants to own their own label, I get it, bro. I totally get it. But, bro, if that's what you want, you better be prepared to work your ass off. Do not think you can put a single out and just for some reason the DJ is going to love your shit and play it all the time for free. <laughs> the only dude I ever seen that got away with that is Lil Nas X. With the country record because the kids were saying they went crazy. They went crazy. Yeah. That's how he got it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you ain't got that, what's well, stop? You know it costs to play your record in the club. <laughs> you know it's gonna cost you some money. Yeah, that's just the real. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So if you if that's what you if that's what you about, bro, because it's like this. Organized noise. We have a label thing right now. It's with RPM, but at the yeah. same time, it's cool. But we're starting to really get it, get we're getting to this this you know 
this 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 time of music and trying to figure out um, the best way to sell records because yes, the, uh, you know the internet help you and you got certain sites that'll play your record, but that is not guaranteed, bro. Goody Mob has an album out right now and it's like two years old, maybe a year old. It's about, about two years old. Yeah. A lot of people still don't know. Yeah. And we've done promotion on it. We put it here, we put it there, and they still don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's so weird to me that that the internet should be more helpful to music, but it's really not. What I realized about that internet, it's an algorithm and it eats, it's hungry. Yeah. So you can get that algorithm a uh, T-bone steak filet mignon one yeah. time. Yeah. But that motherfucker like the snack. Yeah. <laughs> if you get that algorithm something to snack on every day. Yeah. It's gonna bound something bound the surface to the top. Right. And that's how the shit winds up hitting. Okay. Like I tell folks, you look at future. It's kind of like the same algorithm that Master P had. He really? drop, 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 drop. Yeah. Future came around and did it again. Drop, 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 drop. Right. If you dropping like that, yeah. something gonna catch. But what happens with the algorithm, when something catches, it gives them the catalog. Mm. But something got to catch yeah, that's for the them to get it. the catalog. That's the thing about it. something has to catch. But when it catches and they catches that out uh that catalog, yeah. Yeah, that's it, when it, you it, out of here. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is true. But it's a risk. But it's like lottery, man. It's yeah, like, exactly. It's, lottery, it's like it's a risk. Lottery. But some but it's it's going to catch. Yeah. Because the algorithm is paying attention to who's feeding it. Right. So right. if you feeding it, it's going to feed who feeds them. That's why they call it a YouTube partnership. Right. And this whole streaming thing is bullshit, bro. Yeah. You know, how you going to have a million streams and pay me $1,400? Not $14,000 or $140,000. $1,400 off a million that streams. Sense. Yeah. That makes no sense mm -mm. at all. Like, what are your thoughts about this new digital age, man? Coming from a time where you had the hardcore CDs and stuff, hand to hand combat you know you're getting this amount of money off of each CD to you don't even know what the hell's going on with the streaming part because you just they talking about a point zero zero one percent and don't know about it I'm not a calculus major look man it, I mean it was even dirtier when you know what I'm saying when he had CDs and everything too nothing really mm. changed but they just okay. gotten really dirty with this with streaming it's just it doesn't make sense that you're making that much that less of money like I'm not saying Cause okay, if everybody had a million streams, it would be crazy to have to pay everybody a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I get that, but what is what the what y'all are breaking it down to be is just damn ridiculous. Like, come on, bro. Yeah, really? Like, it, it, it's almost to the point where streaming don't even matter. I yep. mean, it does. You know, to most artists out there that you know get their awards and stuff, most stream artists of fourteen billion, a million, yep. what? Cool, but to me. I'm still an old school dude. I I have to fuck with it. Because that's what I mean. Do I like it? Hell no. I feel Am you. I looking forward to a streaming check? Fuck no. Yep. <laughs> Come on. I mean, it, help, it helps. It helps. Okay, 1400 does help. Yep. 500 does help. It, yeah, okay, great. But I feel you. I'm going to be pissed, bro, if I got. Two million streams, and then I get this check, and I'm like, bro, <laughs> oh shit, at least I can take care of Bill this month. Now I will say that. Come on. Gotta take care of Bill, but God, that should be way more money than that. I feel you. It makes no sense that they do artists like that. It, it, it's crazy to me, bro. It's what, crazy. What do you think about being independent then now and maneuvering that way? Or is it that. No, I like, I like, in the, I like that lane. I'm uh -huh. just saying. They treat that lane like you are a major, mm. okay? I've heard some, you know, uh, guys say, well, it costs 100000 to blow up a single. Who the fuck got 100000 independent, bro? Come on. Who got that? So, that's what I'm saying. It should be more fair to independent artists, okay? You have certain platforms, and yes, you can put them on there and do that stuff, but I think it should be even more 
for the independent artist that's doing his or doing his or hers own thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It should be a little more fair to it than, you know, what y'all doing because it don't make sense at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not fair. I don't even know how you will feel that like this crap y'all doing is fair <laughs> as far as sending the money. I bet y'all making millions off this shit. Come on. Y'all going to give somebody $200. What's wrong with that shit, man? Exactly. Go on with that, bro. So, you know. That's how I feel about it. When you look back over your career, though, now sleeping, what was your favorite time that you enjoyed and you said, you know what, this is what I did it for? That was 94, 95, 96. Mm. Yes, sir. That was, that was my favorite time because, you know, we were fresh and new and we had ideas and, you know, everybody was willing to hear them and, you know, so much cooperation then, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it was, uh, that was a great time. Making dreams come to fruition, man. How the hell did y'all go about making that happen, man? Because, I mean, we all got dreams out here. We all want to see them motherfuckers through. But a lot of times, they can't even get past thinking of the dream. <laughs> you know what? We got, I'm going to say this. We got lucky, man, because, you know, all of us was friends from from uh, T-Boz and just everybody. Dallas, we all went to Jelly Bean Skate Marine together. Mm -hmm. So Dallas and Jermaine was, were, were the first kind of two uh, major producers to kind of make it out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jermaine used to look out for us, too. Like, we were uh, going to sign with Jermaine at one time as Organized Noise. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we did, we did, um, um, what's the group? Oh, damn, the girls. Escape. escape. We did Escape tonight. They're record on their first album. Mm. We did, like, two records on them. Uh, Atlanta, man, one thing I say about the A, we always had each other back. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we all... We all knew, everybody knew they had talent. So when T-Boz got on with Pebbles, she promised us that she would tell Pebbles about us. And she kept her word. Yeah. So when we met her, Pebbles heard the music that we were doing. We was a singing group. She heard the music we were doing. She's like, who did the beats? Everybody pointed at me. She's like, well, you finna meet L.A., her husband at the time. You mm. remember, you're about to meet him. She took me over to meet him, met him. I didn't even sign with them or anything. The first day L.A. said to me, was like, you got your own equipment? I was like, not really. He said, well, I'm going to get you some equipment. Mm -hmm. And that man gave me like $10,000 worth of equipment. Woo. Just on the strength. Yeah. And, you know, it was just kind of like with that kind of, with them coming to Atlanta showing that kind of love to young artists and wanting to see what y'all, what we had, it was, it was so, it was lucky and it was a blessing. Answer me this, Sleepy. What is it that you think star quality consists of? If you see somebody out here in the street, how do you know who's a star and who ain't, being that you won and you've been up close and personal with so many? You, you don't know. Um, mm. You, you kind of just don't. It's kind of up to that person when it's time for time for them to shine, shine. Um, uh, but some artists, I will change, some artists – that I've met that <laughs> might rap or something or, you know, some people got the look. Yeah. But that don't mean they got the talent, but they got that look. Yeah. So, but these days you can make that work. Yeah. Uh, so I have met, okay, I'll say this. I knew Nibia mm. was gonna be a talent because she was with us first. Mm. Moan, Ramon, Money Moan, yes, who worked sir. for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he brought Nibia in and we, we saw her and, uh, she said, this came in from Savannah. We heard a scene. We were like, yeah, we'll sign her. So I knew she was something super special. Um, so I will say that about, about her. Um, who else? Uh, I'm going to say this, man. When I first heard Backbone rap, mm. Backbone was insane with it. Yeah. Like, truthfully. Like, he was really, <laughs> like, started to be one of my favorite rappers out of the family. Yeah. That's the fat face. Yeah, and then like when CeeLo first came to the house and CeeLo, cause this is the funny thing, when CeeLo first came to the house, he sang for us. Mm. And I was so blown away by his voice, I could not believe how beautiful that voice was. Yeah. And then he started rapping, we were like, oh shit. <laughs> Damn, okay, yeah. so, you know, I changed that. It, you, you, <laughs> you, you can meet some people that you'll just be like, damn, they'll stop. Yeah. You can't say that. Now, does that mean they'll be a star? I don't know. But if you meet them and you see that star quality, you can't see star quality in people. What is it that Sleepy want to do next? Man, I just want to put this album out. 
I want to do a solo album. And then I don't know. I just I don't know what I might want to do. I, I just want to get those two things out and done, hit the road, promote them, do whatever I got to do. I don't know. Maybe after that next solo album, I'm done. I don't know. Mm. I don't know what I'm doing. It's according, it's according to who still want to hear me. If they still want to hear me, then I'll do something. Oh, they want to hear you. And uh, I guess I'll be doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah nigga. Uh, when it <laughs> comes, you feel me? What are your thoughts now when you see hip hop getting to the point to where artists are dying almost every other month and it's major artists it's not yeah man you know it's regular sad, folks bro. No more. It's, it's like a Tupac and a Biggie every dog on weekend every dog on weekend you right about that bro it makes no sense at all man and for it to, to happen to a lot of artists on Empire is really weird to me mm. you know what I mean a lot of those artists were signed to Empire yeah I'm like now that is weird you know what I'm saying mm. Uh, I think it's terrible, man, but that's what happens when you bring the streets to that game. You're not going to be able to leave the streets. The streets going to follow you everywhere you go. Yeah. I don't care what new job you got and how much money you're making. It's always going to walk behind you and look at you and see what you're doing. It's just how it goes. So you just have to be careful, man. I, I hate that that happened. To Dolphin, to everybody else, man. Yes, uh, and I'm not saying it's their fault at all, because it ain't. It ain't. It's the streets, man. It's like it's like everybody in your hood happy you made it, but it's always one. It's always one that can't stand it. Mm. And he might be the closest one to you. So you gotta watch it, man. You got it's it, it's sad, but you really gotta watch who you're around. It's terrible, man, because to even say that, you know what I'm saying, when you got your boys around, you're supposed to be able to trust your family that's around you. Yeah. And always know that you got your, that they got your back, which they probably did have his back. But, I, you know, I understand, though, because I'm a lot like that, too. I like to travel alone. Yeah. I don't want to travel with security and, and all this stuff. Security and entourage. But times you kind of need that. Yeah. I've never been a street person. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna lie. You know, sold no drug. Ain't no shot nobody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I ain't never did nothing. <laughs> I so I don't have you know that that that's it's not on me. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But an artist like 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 Dolph was. I mean, he. You know what I'm saying? We heard about him getting into it with things with people with this and with that with that and this. And to me, I just wish he would have had security with him. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I heard he shot back, and I heard it was it was going down and all this stuff, but it didn't even have to come to that, man. Yeah. You know, that man got a family. You know? Yeah. And he got young fans. The one little young boy that was crying about his death. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, sad, crazy. man. And, you know, I think if I was from that side of it, even though I would hate it, I would always have security around me. Yeah. I just would. Yeah. I would have around my house. I have around just... When my girl go to the store, it'll be security around her. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Because you just never know, man. You don't know who going to mess with you or who planning to touch you. You don't, You have no idea, bro. You can just be sitting at the light. Yeah. And they recognize your car. It's scary, man. It's, 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 it, and it's getting scarier because I just heard Clarence, Clarence Avon, the, the godfather yeah. of, of black entertainment, period, in Hollywood. He got... He got us our deal. He worked our deal. He Damn. worked. He worked everybody deal. You know in music, and for his house to get robbed and his wife get shot is terrible. That is just my God. That man. is this man has put black people on for years with deals and just movies and the whole now you can't say black Hollywood without saying his name. Yeah, and they're gonna run up in his house and do that, man. That's crazy. That's crazy. So you never know, bro. You never know. And times are getting even more crazy. So you gotta you gotta be careful and you know, you gotta have security, I guess. What advice do you got for artists coming into the game now then on how to just navigate it and to deal with the different twists and turns or the different levels that they gonna face in this thing? Cause it's cute when everybody start. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, but when you get in that thing and you realize you're working like hell, or yeah, the money's coming job, in, it turns into something else. Yeah, a lot of people think it's just a fantasy. You do a video, go home, and you chill. Nah, bro, you got. Line, you have you have first of all, you gonna have a phone phoners from, <laughs> from 
from 9 a.m. <laughs> to 10 p.m. Yep. 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's just the truth. A lot of people don't understand. A lot comes with this. A lot of traveling. A lot of uh, personal. You just it's, it's so much that it could be. You know that's why you hear about some of the artists kind of going not going crazy, but just have to take breaks. Yeah, because it gets like that, man. You need and a break. So to me, to prepare yourself for this game, you can't. You just have to be willing to work. And if you feel like you're like you feel like you're falling out of control, let your people know, man. Say, hold on, man. I just I, I know we got this to do, but just give me a minute. Let me breathe. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to you have to talk and make sure to let people know how you're feeling, so you can have a level head, man. Because you know, once people get you to start working, it's this. Yeah, and it's nonstop. You know, I mean, I remember being, being times when Cash was on the road and they thought their tour was over. And they managed to call them and say, nah, man, y'all got a whole nother tour. And they was happy to be home. And they only got one day to be home. And they go right back on tour. they like, man, what the? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's a job. You sell records, that's what come with it. What do you think? Do you think it was that kind of stuff that made Andre say, you know what, I just want to relax and do me? Yeah, I do. Because now, let me remind you, when they came out, they were young. They were still teenagers. So we worked them from Southern Player List all the way up. To love below. My That's God. That's when he had had enough and he was tired of it, you know. And I get it. You know, you we worked in the death and you will, you've done everything you could do. Went diamond in this thing before we uh, clocked out now. Exactly. Exactly. What money you I want think, from it? And I think he don't want it. I think at that point he knew having an album of the year that they were going to get the shit worked out of him. Because <laughs> we had already did like every uh, award show, every – I mean, we did, we were in California, man. We did damn near every show. And I know he was tired of it because by the time we had did MTV, he said, well, here I am performing this for the 260 million time. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh-oh. Somebody don't want to do this. That <laughs> was a change. Mm. I don't blame him. But I can't say that for Big. Big, man, he still love to perform. That's what I love about him. He still love it. Cause I, I think he was more trained for it in high school than Dre was. Dre was more of a a painter, an artist, a, yeah. you know, just mind just just open on everything. And Big was like in acting classes, and yeah, it's a video of him when he was in high school coming around the corner rapping and stuff. Like you can see who kind of really wanted it more. Mm. That's why Big still does it. Yeah, he still loves it. What keeps you doing it? I still love music. Yeah, I still love music. You know, I like I said, I grew up backstage, bro. I seen every band perform, and you know what I'm saying? When I first seen my dad perform at the age of six, I couldn't believe that was my dad. I was like, oh, I <laughs> got to do this. Yeah, yeah. I seen how those women were screaming and grabbing for him, and dad got the number one hit in the, in the world. I'm like, oh, man, that's my pop. Let me get to it. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's still that. Like, my dad is still performing. My God. He still performs. What are those conversations like? How does he feel about seeing his son make a legendary mark and then following in his footsteps oh, as well, though? That's got to super, be a feeling, he's man. super proud. He always tells me how proud yeah. he is because um, I don't think he really wanted me to do music. I don't think my mama wanted me to do mm. music. You know, they wanted me to do something else because he knew what, came what with comes it. with, you know, what came with music. Damn. So, but by me doing it, he smiled though. He loved it. Yeah. He loves it, you know. So to be able to see that you can handle it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To see I can handle it and to see I can make it. He it that really touched him. He loves it. Lastly, sleepy, what is it that you want your fans to know? And how can E folk contact you, man? Man, what I want my fans to know is that I'm still around. Um, I'm, I'm still going to make music. If you need to see me, just hit me on Instagram. I'm on there all the time. Um it ain't hard to find me. <laughs> it, ain't find, it ain't hard to find an old man. You can find me. Yes, sir. Sleep. Appreciate okay. you coming through this thing, All boss. Right, Wish man. you nothing but the best and much success. Yes, sir. Behind Radio Shouty. Holler at y'all in a minute, man. We gone. Yeah.